The Montauk Manor is a famous high-end hotel on the east end of Long Island, built by Carl Fisher, the proprietor of Miami Beach, the Indianapolis Raceway, and the first cross-country highway in the U.S. called the Lincoln Highway, connecting New York City to San Francisco. This property has an extended history long before the manor was built, which we will cover in detail. Shortly after the manor's opening, the stock market crash of 1929, followed by the Great Depression, put an end to Carl Fisher's dreams. Not long after, following Carl Fisher's death in 1939 and the beginnings of World War II, the Navy took over the Montauk Manor and the Carl Fisher Tower downtown, which happens to be the former site of the U.S. Navy dirigible space. It was actually a, a big warehouse, a big hangar that stored two blimps for surveillance. Other rumors say that Carl Fisher built the manor and tower to interconnect with underground tunnels for his own personal use. You can see why the Navy would further utilize this property. Let's dive further back into the property's history. For thousands of years, the Montauk tribe utilized Montauk's hilly terrain and watery seclusion as a perfect defensive position. There were several stockade forts in Montauk, and where the manor stands is called Fort Hill or Signal Hill, and Signal Hill was considered the main fort and home of Chief Wyndanch's own personal village. There was also a large burial area just outside the fort and village. You can still make out the outline of the fort that once stood there on satellite images to this day, just south of the Montauk Manor. It was also the location of Council Rock, a massive quartz stone where the tribes of Long Island would all gather to discuss important matters. Large fires were lit from hill to hill to call for such meetings. All the tribes of Long Island were under the leadership of the Montauk tribe, which was further bolstered when Lion Gardner and Chief Wyndanch became very close allies. In 1653, the Narragansett Sachem Ninigret took up issue with Chief Wyndanch over his alliance with Lion Gardner. There was a raid on the Montauk village. The battle took place in a valley just north of Fort Hill, which was later named Massacre Valley. Thirty Montauk warriors were killed, and fourteen prisoners were taken, including Chief Wyndanch's daughter. One prisoner was burned in response to Chief Wyndanch's previous treatment of one of Ninigret's messengers. But with the help of Lion Gardner and the rest of the Montauk warriors, they were able to rescue Chief Wyndanch's daughter, the princess of the Montauk tribe. Both Chief Wyndanch and Lion Gardner died, and their union fell apart. As the years went by, the Montauk tribe was devastated by smallpox and were subject to several false land exchanges. A small schoolhouse was built on Signal Hill in the mid-1800s on this location, which later burned down. In 1895, the Long Island Railroad purchased 4,000 acres of Montauk land, and the following year, there was an attempt to establish a transatlantic port for steamer ships. In 1896, the Montauk Inn was built to support the transatlantic port. It was built on the very same location of the Montauk Schoolhouse, which burned down, which was also built on the same location as the Montauk tribe's fort and village. In 1898, Camp Wickoff was established to house 30,000 sick and dying troops that were the first veterans of a, of a foreign war to return to U.S. soil. There were many quarantine hospitals dotted around Montauk, but the main detention hospital, soldiers in the worst condition, the sickest of them all, were sent to the detention hospital on Fort Hill, where many died. Many of the soldiers that died at Montauk died of starvation and fever. In 1926, the Montauk Inn mysteriously burned, and the same year, Carl Fisher broke ground on the Montauk Manor. More death was added to the property, with several workers died in various construction accidents, some having fell into the cemented portions of the wall and because they were not able to be retrieved, their bodies are literally encased in the walls. To add insult to injury, the sacred Montauk at burial ground was excavated and remains were not only disturbed and built upon, but they were even added into the mortar mixture that made up the walls. Carl Fisher's dream collapsed, and he bankrupted his work in Miami Beach to dump even more money into his dreams of making Montauk the Miami Beach of the North. Carl Fisher eventually died in 1939 of cirrhosis of the liver. It may be possible that his personal tunnels were for bootlegging purposes, as Montauk was one of the major suppliers of illegal booze that made its way into New York City's speakeasies of the 20s. I'm not saying he was involved in any business dealings. 
This just may have been for his personal leisure. Nevertheless, there is evidence of these, the existence of these tunnels. In 1939, the Navy occupied the Montauk Manor as a barracks and took over the Montauk Tower downtown as a command post. And after World War II, they were abandoned. For over 20 years, the hotel sat unoccupied until 1970, when it was converted into over 100 individual condominiums, which are available to rent and has remained open to the public ever since. In the 50 years of hotel guests, many stories have circulated on the strange goings-on inside the hotel or on the property. Accounts of several entities and phenomena have been reported over the years. Some of the lore includes a Native American chief primarily occupying the fourth floor in room 414 has been reported to stand in the corners and the shadows of the walls and is said to look out and watch over the guests of the hotel. Some guests have described waking up and seeing the Native American chief standing at the edge of their bed, calmly watching them. Reports of tribal drumming and chants heard outside the hotel are widespread. In fact, one person even claims to have recorded them. These rumors are well known and have been experienced by hotel employees as well as guests. Four angry fuzzy spirits, or blurry spirits, that seem to cause mischief in the hotel. Most people think that these entities are behind slamming doors, moving objects, and general ruckus around the hotel. Others believe that these may be restless spirits that died in accidents building the hotel. A female apparition is said to roam the hallways of the fourth floor, and some people closely associate slamming doors and flickering lights to this ghost that seems to have poltergeist-like qualities. Two men staying on the second floor reported seeing a black sphere roll across the floor and dissolve right before their eyes. Other reported manifestations could be described as electrical interferences or anomalies, disembodied sounds and voices, and a general feeling of restlessness, inability to sleep, or being watched. We have even more details of specific eyewitness reports and other stories of strange events, which we will elaborate on in the last part of this video. First, we would like to move on to our own personal experiences and observations, covering the handful of times we were fortunate enough to stay at the Montauk Manor. The first time we ever stayed at the Manor was in 2002, in room 310. We were excited to be close to the fourth floor, as we heard that's where most of the activity happened. We enjoyed our time in the luxury hotel, just relaxing, and didn't expect much. Our main goal was to explore the base. However, on the first night, we both woke up at 3 in the morning for some reason. Something woke us up and we don't remember what it was. We had a great view on the east-facing side of the hotel, which you can see the Montauk radar directly out of our window. This of course led me to blame the radar right away when I woke up at 3 a.m. not knowing what happened and felt very strange, but honestly I have no clue what woke us up, I just know something did. Look how close you can zoom with this thing. Wow, oh my god, you got it good. That is the infamous radar tower that they say it doesn't move, but it's bullshit because it moves.
The next morning, Daniel found some kind of allergic reaction developing on knees, elbows, arms, and legs. We didn't think much of it, and we went about our day going to the point, came back. Well, the following night, Daniel's allergic reaction was severe, and she broke out in hives. She tried to wake me up to take her to the hospital. It was so bad. But she said I was dead to the world and would not wake up for anything, which is very unusual for me. The next morning, I took one look at her condition and had our bags packed in 15 minutes and got us to Southampton Hospital just in time as they took her right in, gave her epinephrine, put her on an IV, and told her that she had started going into anaphylactic shock from a severe allergic reaction. It's strange because before we went to the trip, she slammed her finger in a very heavy vault and got stitches in her thumb, and they gave her penicillin. Well, somehow a spontaneous allergy to penicillin developed in the two days we were at the Montauk Manor, and this almost led to complete anaphylactic shock, which means her, her breathing passages were closing up, and it was a true emergency. That was a very strange incident and a very strange way to end our first stay at the manor. I've never read this in a The next three times I was able to stay in the Montauk Manor, I was put up in the room by different production companies for three different shows, the first of which they purposefully stuck me in room 415, which was right next door to room 414, where the Native American chief supposedly stays. This room is off limits to guests and has been closed for some reason or another. Now the funny thing is, this room was large and I had plenty of room to spread out all my research papers and there were no other paranormal feelings in my stay there. However, if you look out my window, the the window to room 415 directly next door is very close and in direct view of my window. So I did stare into that empty room into the window a few times from my window and I got a very strange feeling doing so, almost uh, prompting me to look away. Other than that, I felt truly peaceful in that room, I felt like somebody was looking out for me, I had no bad vibes, and I was utterly happy with it, I have a lot of respect for the Montauka tribe obviously, and hopefully this spirit could sense that other spirits in the hotel do not sound as friendly. The third time I stayed was in room 201. The Travel Channel didn't have permission to film at Camp Hero on the base at all, there would only be an interview scene in the main lobby downstairs of the manor. For this reason, I spent a lot of time in the room, and again, didn't experience anything. There was no feelings of, there was no paranormal activity or anything to report. However, the room had its own terrace on the back courtyard, and directly outside of the window, I noticed this small flower pot, which happens to be a gargoyle, looking into my room hopefully protecting. Also in my room there was a picture hanging on the wall that was very fitting. It was a picture of the small bunker near the lighthouse that tumbled down the cliffs onto the beach. On my fourth stay at the manor, I stayed in room 352. And there wasn't, a, again, there wasn't much to report, except for that this room was way too large for just one person. I appreciate this space, but this room was big enough to fit a family. There was no strange feelings to report, nothing strange at all. I spent four days in this room, even though I was only needed for two days during this filming with CW. Not that I was complaining. In this time, I believe I slept decently. I may have woken up. It's hard to gauge whether I got a decent night's sleep or woke up just because of my nerves having to do an interview. There was one spot in the room I didn't like going into, which was a small alcove or hallway near some closets. It was kind of a dead end and for some reason I just didn't like going in that one spot. But it wouldn't be until my fifth stay at the hotel 
where we experienced something truly paranormal during the night. On our fifth stay in room 144, we had never stayed on the first floor before and we were surprised to see a loft in the middle of the room to a second story within the room. This was also a strange room because the loft was very shaky and didn't seem very stable. So walking up to the second floor felt like the place was going to collapse. We actually went, checked in our bags and saw one couple and then we went right to the Navy base to explore for the day. Upon returning back to the hotel, we saw the very same couple again and then again before getting to our room. That night, we couldn't sleep very well. We kept waking up every hour on the hour, totally uncomfortable, and we kept hearing things. The strange thing is, we heard people running down the hallway, kids laughing, and an ice machine. And after looking, there was no ice machine anywhere nearby. Besides the first time Brian and I went to the manor, the one that sticks with me the most is our last time, which we got from Brian's sister as a gift for, it was his birthday, that's what it was. And then we were gonna explore the base and stay at the manor. So we go to the base, we explore the base all day. We have a great time. And we get back to the hotel and I said, I'm gonna go lay down and um, Brian was gonna get the stuff out of the car. So I go lay on the bed and all of a sudden I hear people walking down the hallways and I hear an ice machine and I'm like, oh, awesome, they have ice because we have, we always, I always drink green tea, etc. So we're like, yes, ice. So he comes back in and I'm like, B, they have an ice machine. He's like, really? I was like, yeah. I was like, I just heard it down the hallway. I said, I heard a bunch of people talking. And so he goes and he says, there's no ice machine anywhere. I said, there has to be. He goes, no, I asked, there's no ice machine. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So I, I was just like, how could that be? Because I, I had heard people walking the hallways all night. So after the faux pas of thinking there was an ice machine, we could not sleep at all. Every two hours, it sounded like people were walking the hallways, tons of people. And when we had gotten there, there was only one couple. And we kept coming across this couple. And like, you know how our channel is Montauk is strange, but also people in Montauk are creepy. And I don't, and I don't mean that in a bad way because it to certain people who are locals. But you come across, we came across this couple. They kept appearing every place we went. Everywhere we went, there they were. And so that was another bizarre thing. And there was nobody at the freaking hotel. I said to Brian, I was like, there's gotta be people here. There must have been a party, you know, something going on the night before because I, I, we both heard people up all night. Well, no, it was like us and maybe the creepy couple and that's it at that point. This definitely stood out as an uncomfortable night akin to the first time that we stayed and were woken up. I love it. The next day we went to Camp Hero in the rain and uh, walked a good amount, had a fun day, and we were actually happy to leave the manor at that time. After our night of broken sleep and all the strange sounds, I went ahead and read a few dozen reviews on TripAdvisor and Google, and I did find that many guests complained of poor sleep, although many people blame the poor quality of the sheets, but I now tend to think it was more than that. Many of the reviews noted the similarity in appearance to the hotel in Stephen King's The Shining. I also have some interesting information found in a book that I received only three months ago called Long Island Oddities, Curious Locales and Unusual Occurrences by John Lita and Laura Lita. They had a section on the Montauk Manor and their visit there and they did a great job collecting some of the reports and stories that you don't hear too often or at all. Here's a quote directly from the book. The most chilling story revolved around a family with a two-year-old. From the moment the family arrived, the two-year-old began screaming, Ghost! She carried on so much and for so long that the bewildered family had to cut their visit short and leave at 2 a.m. A few accounts on disembodied voices that I found. One directly from the book. A woman on the fourth floor in the winter, when there were very few guests, called the front desk in a panic. She was taking a shower and heard someone speaking in a foreign language inside her room. 
Someone came to investigate and left, satisfied that there were no intruders, only to receive another frantic call. The foreign voices resumed moments later. There were currently no guests even close to her room. Another hidden gem found online regarding more disembodied voices. Actually, in my opinion, this is actually disembodied voices mistaken to be unruly guests of the hotel. This poor girl. Security guard comes to her room at 1 a.m., banging on the door aggressively and pretty much terrifies them. They're in bed, they're like in their pajamas, and according to them, they were talking at a normal voice, uh, talking about eyeglasses, no less. And uh, the security guard was saying that, you know, you're gonna have to leave the hotel, you know, you're being too loud. And uh, he wasn't in his uniform. And they were totally confused, thinking that he had the wrong room, but he, because they said they were talking in a normal voice, but he swears that he heard them from five floors down on the in the courtyard, and they're up on the fourth floor, fourth floor again. That does seem to be the floor with all the activity, or a lot of the activity. They tried to correct them, they said it was their room, you know, it wasn't them. Here's what they say directly. We were on the top floor using normal inside voices. I explained that I was having a conversation about using eyeglasses, and there was no way my normal inside voice could be heard from outside, five floors down. I also asked him why I wasn't called on the phone if our noise level was unacceptable. Good point. He had no answer. That's strange. You know, he's kind of like acting like a zombie in a way. I don't know, some people have suggested that. I, I have my own idea about this, but when you're paying 500 a night, that's very true. You don't expect something like that. And they stayed for two nights, so they paid a grand and uh, they were just really confused. The lady at the desk was rude, maybe just defensive. Um, you know, it's a bad review of course, so I'm not trying to read like the bad review parts, I'm just trying to say somebody knocking violently on the door in the middle of the night telling them that they should leave the hotel. Uh, it's just really strange. I think this is what I think happened. I think the guy thought he heard, he heard disembodied voices. He thought it was the girls or he was on, he got it in his head that it was that room and he went to it almost like on autopilot but I do not believe that he actually heard those girls talking. I think he heard something else. Another strange report from Montauk. One TripAdvisor report told of a mysterious fire alarm that went off at 3.45 a.m., sending the guests scrambling down the stairs from the fourth floor. They were so panicked, they tripped, they ran to the front desk, and the front desk explained that it was just an electrical surge, and it just sounds like they this has happened before. They had the explanation ready and prepared it sounds like there's an awful lot of unexplained electric i mean it's an old hotel maybe it's bad wiring but to me uh there's probably a lot more of these reports than them we'll ever get to collect all into one place in this book they also were curious about the very same steam tunnels and boiler area that i was they actually found their way into the boiler room tried to use their room key card to open a second door thinking they had found the staircase that leads down to the steam tunnels that we saw on the sci-fi show. At that moment uh, they realized they were on camera. The front desk actually rang a phone nearby. They picked it up. The front desk said, what are you doing down there? You're not supposed to be there and if you want to know something then just come upstairs. They said at that moment the elevator just opened by itself. So they ended up going to the front desk, talking with them for hours, and they were, you know, having a good conversation. And um, they asked them, you know, how did you do that with the elevators? And they said, we don't have any controls, you know, we don't really know. But uh, we have to admit that they were not the only ones to experience elevators opening on their own. After their conversation, heading back to their room, it happened again. The elevator opened up when they were standing nearby. And they did, you know, drive home the fact that there were no sensors, no motion detectors to open elevators when people are nearby, no controls behind the desk to open them uh, in such a way. So uh, there seems to be electrical anomalies in the hotel, for sure. In terms of the vibes there, so many that have died and passed on, I wonder it feels almost like if all the spirits there almost are congregating in a way to, to and talking with each other because 
I've always heard that if people die suddenly or unexpectedly where they don't know they're dead, their spirit body, you know, kind of like poltergeists it, and it really did sound like there were people walking up and down the hallways all night. The hotel itself, I have never liked the vibe there, ever. I don't like staying there, and I said to Brian when we left, I said, that's the last time we're staying there. If you're going there for paranormal activity, hunting, you will have a field day, and I recommend it if you're into that. But if you want a good night's sleep after you walk the, the base all day, no. Because <laughs> you're not going to get it. And I hope you found our story interesting. And we appreciate you all. Thank you all for watching. And keep it strange. Dan Alien and myself would like to give a few shout outs. Let you guys know we appreciate you all. This is the first time we've done this, but if we forgot you, we'll definitely throw you in next time. And it's not on purpose. We would probably name you all. Mike Minnick, LIB, Long Island Bigfoot, Dark Hour Paranormal, Green Country Forest People, North Alabama Cryptid, Moon Talk, Bigfoot Anon, North Michigan Bigfoot, Charles Louts, Infinite Reality, Paul Goetz, Chris Anola, Scotty B, Daily Dan, Gavin, Junior, Blues and Jeevies, Aaron Morrison, Great Tall Cloud, Rob S, Toby, Coral on Jackie O, Cashew Kazuntite, Adirondack Bushmaster, Gufon, Alex Oian, Third Face of Moon, Sheila Arizona, Tacey Hale, Brad Bernstein, Len Greenhill, Peter Moon, Samantha Maloney, Joe Lofreno, Chip Revis, Robin and Rocco, Paul Fagan, The Montauk Manor.